Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat 119 featuring an interview with Josh Mandel of Sierra Online. He's responsible for Space Quest 6, Freddy Farkas, and much more. In this first part of the interview, we talk mostly about his background, how he got started at Sierra, and his thoughts on the move from parser to point-and-click adventures. A lot of great stuff, so without further ado, here is Mr. Josh Mandel. All right, folks, I am here with Josh Mandel. He is the guy. He took the usual career path. He was telling me from stand-up comedy to advertising to game design. <laughs> He's uh, probably best known for Freddie Farkas, Frontier Pharmacist, Tallahans Cross Time Saloon, and Space Quest Six. So how are you doing today, Josh? I'm doing great, and it's an honor to be here, Matt. I've, I've watched your podcast on numerous occasions, so I was thrilled that you asked me to uh, participate. Pleasure's all mine. So uh, I was asking you before, what's going on now? I understand you've had a lot of problems with the uh, the Hurricane Irene and some damage there. So, Yeah, yeah, we got hit pretty hard here. Our house sits very low in the water table. We drain into a creek. The creek filled up, so the water filled up, uh, went into our basement. I lost my Vectrex. I lost most of my Sierra and Infocom collections. I lost uh, my Virtual Boy. Uh, uh, I lost a lot of old, like, Sierra design documents and things like that. Fortunately, none of the artwork. The artwork is all in the hands of uh, the people who were working on the Art of Sierra book. So I was very fortunate in that. I know a lot of people will probably cringe <laughs> to hear about all that. It's yeah. just terrible. All right, so uh, shifting from that then, <laughs> uh, before you joined uh, Sierra... In April of 1990, you were doing, we just referenced it, some acting and comedy work. I've seen some vague descriptions of this, but can you go into a little bit more detail about what type of a comedy show you were doing? Sure. Uh, our, uh, the comedy show that I did with a woman named Karen McVeigh, uh, who is a distant relative of Tim McVeigh, but I don't think she likes to talk about that. Uh, we did comedy that grew out of improv and sketches that we came up with in college. We worked together in the theater department in college for many years. Uh, we formed an improv group to sort of take the place of uh, Kentucky Fried Theater, which had been the big improv group in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, a few years before we got there. We did uh, sketches, we did commercial parodies, we bantered, we did balloon animals, we did magic. Uh, it was like a, like a little variety show. And in fact, um, you can actually see a clip of some of the sketches that we did because somebody put up on YouTube, if you search for Mandel and McVeigh, you can find uh, this clip of a show that we did. I think it was in Boulder, Colorado in like 1984 or something like that, where I've got my legs behind my neck at one point and stuff like that. So you can actually see a little bit of one of our old shows. Well, legs behind your neck. Yes, I used to do contortions also as part of the show. Wow. Okay, so you said uh, from there you went into advertising. Mm -hmm. And you don't sound like the typical advertising guy at all. I was just looking at a quotation uh, where you say that advertising should provide real information. It should be about news, about products. And you don't like uh, what you call image-based advertising. So do you right. mind uh, just elaborating a little bit on that? Oh, sure. Um, I think advertising can serve a very good and useful purpose uh, when you're telling people about something that they may not know about and you're trying to educate them when something important or significant uh, has come along that could actually make a difference somehow in people's lives. But uh, I found that much more often I was being asked to do, well, the same thing that, that everyone there is asked to do, which is we need to do a commercial, but we have nothing of significance to say beyond, you know, well, this is a soft scrub with bleach. So, like, at one point I was I was told, okay, uh, do a commercial for Soft Scrub with Bleach, and you have to make the tagline, you will, you will sing your stains away. Um, <laughs> that was not what I went into advertising to do. Uh, I wanted to inform, and I wanted to entertain. And uh, it, it was pretty dreary. It, it was nothing at all like what Darren Stevens does on Bewitched. 
So, which was all I knew about advertising when I first went into the field. So, um, I was disappointed. Well, it must have been a nice uh, move when you got to uh, Sierra as a junior producer. So, right. how did this? Uh, how did you end up there? How did you get from advertising to Sierra? Well. From back when uh, Karen and I were on the road, we used to play video games constantly. And after a while, I thought, how can I defray the costs of all these video games I'm buying? Well, I could write reviews and sell them to magazines. And that's what I ended up doing for quite a few years. I wrote a lot of reviews for uh, video games and computer entertainment magazine, uh, which was a Larry Flint publication. Uh, and uh, a couple of other magazines. And from there, I started doing the same thing on CompuServe, on the Gamers Forum in CompuServe. And it was on CompuServe that I met Garuka Singh Khalsa, who, I didn't know this at the time, was the producer at Sierra. And when one of the other sysops, that's what they used to call the person in charge there on, the, uh, on a forum, um, when uh, she let slip to me that Garuka worked for Sierra, I said, oh, man, I'd love to beta test for them because I beta tested for Infocom and I loved it. And so I contacted Garuka and he had me beta test and I beta tested for him on a lot of Sierra games for a couple of years. Uh, and finally, he said, would you be interested in in coming out here and being a junior producer? I really wanted to be a designer, but I thought, oh, it could be a foot in the door. But I probably won't take the job because even though I don't enjoy advertising, it pays really well and I love the people that I'm working with. So I went out to Sierra for an interview and I was so blown away the moment I got there by the beauty of, of Oakhurst and the whole Yosemite environment, uh, by the creativity of the people there. I just It was like walking in a door and you could feel the energy. It was amazing. And I, I walked in thinking, I, I, I got a trip to California out of this, but I'm not, I'll never take the job. And I left thinking I, I would give, I would give up anything to come work here. And, uh, and that's, that's how I ended up doing it. So you mentioned you'd been a fan of, uh, adventure games for a while. Matter of fact, you won a leisure suit, Larry looking for love contest. So, <laughs> Right, right. What's the story uh, behind that? I think that was back in Leisure Suit, uh, during Leisure Suit Larry 2 or 3, uh, there was like a little contest to come up with some sort of all-purpose line for various situations. It, it's a pretty hazy recollection at this point. I don't think I was even beta testing for them at the time, so this was, this was in ancient history. Uh, and I think what I provided was simply, would you like some fries with that? And they used it and it ended up in the game. And that was my first little taste of getting in the door and having my words actually appear on screen in a game. And, and I, man, I was hooked. All right. So we, uh, Augustin Cordes, I uh, wanted me to ask you about your first uh, game there, uh, Zellyard. 1987, it's a side-scrolling action game of role-playing elements of a Japanese uh, import. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about Zellyard? Yes, to the extent that I remember it, which is not too well. It was um, it was from Game Arts, and Game Arts was a Japanese firm with whom uh, Sierra was just beginning a sort of reciprocal arrangement where we would provide uh, our games. To them translated somehow localized for the Japanese market and they would provide us with games too uh, and this was a very new thing for Sierra when I got there they had only done one game so far with this arrangement and I believe that game was Thexter uh, or it might have been Sorcerian because I know that was in progress too that was I think that was also game arts uh, and so all of a sudden I was in the position of having to uh, work closely with the Japanese game arts people, and I didn't know a thing about Japanese business culture uh, or about doing translations for that matter, and this was all new to me. Uh, 
So I probably screwed up several times along the way. I probably said or did things that uh, were frowned upon. Uh, but hey, I, I had no training and, and they knew it. And Zellyard was one of the games that we did not really have a chance to reprogram or adjust very much for the American market, except for the text. The text all needed to be redone. And that was, uh, that fell mostly to me and in largest part to Marty McKenna who uh, wrote, uh, did a lot of writing on dozens and dozens of games for Sierra, uh, was a wonderful talent, and she still is. She, uh, she publishes books now. You can probably find her on Amazon. So, so your next project, if, if I'm uh, looking, if, if my records are accurate, <laughs> sure. now your next project was the Laffer Utilities? Well, actually, my, my very first project there was King's Quest I, uh, the remake of King's Quest I, Okay, that was the uh, first thing you worked on. That was the very first thing that they told me they... Well, that and the Japanese translations are the two things they wanted me to work on uh, first thing in the door. Laffer Utilities came a little while later. Um, I was not particularly proud of the work that I did on that game. So rather than take a usual credit, I just went by the name Joshua. Uh, <laughs> no last names. Um, uh, I, I thought Laffer Utilities was mm, a half-hearted attempt to cash in on the, the, the Larry Laffer phenomena, um, and, uh, it wasn't something I kept on my desktop, <laughs> but I mean, Al did a fine job with it. It had a huge joke database, but I, I did the horror scopes and maybe a few other things, and I was not all that impressed with what I did, so... So I said, let's pretend it's someone else. For some reason, I keep thinking about Microsoft Bob. Oh, dear. No, no, no. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as Microsoft Bob or Clippy. Okay, so let's talk about King's Quest One. You know, I got lots of uh, emails and, and comments you know, about your involvement with this process, and, uh, sort of your uh, thoughts behind it, your philosophy behind it. So... Uh, can you just talk uh, generally about uh, the uh, remake of King's Quest One and your involvement in that? Sure, that had been going on for quite some time already. When I when I first got to Sierra, it had been languishing. Uh, someone else had been working on it for quite some time uh, and dropped out, left the company, something like that, and it wasn't really moving very hard towards towards its release and they wanted it out they wanted it out before king's quest 5 because with king's quest 5 they were going to be introducing the point and click uh uh interface instead of the parser interface and the king's quest 1 remake still i believe had the parser interface um it shows you how bad my memory is now that i can't even remember that but um I got in, I got to meet Roberta right off the bat uh, as, as the project was handed over to me. She really didn't have time to work on it because King's Quest V was, was hot and heavy in development. And uh, I looked at King's Quest I, um, I played the old version, and I asked Roberta if she would mind if I rewrote the text because I thought that the text in the original was very, very sparse and didn't have the flavor of a big legendary game. Uh, and she said, absolutely, feel free, just be sure to bounce stuff off me before, uh, you know, before you put it into the game. And I said, fine, wonderful. And I think of everything that I changed, uh, and I changed one puzzle, I changed the Rumpelstiltskin puzzle, because the original solution to that was very convoluted and I, I couldn't figure it out. And when I finally did figure it out, I thought, this, this isn't quite fair. So I asked Roberta if she would mind if I, if I changed that. And she said, you know, that probably should be changed. Go right ahead. So she was open to everything. And the only other change that I made that she said no to was at the very end when you have the treasures. One of them is a mirror. Uh, that mirror appears on the wall in King's Quest IV. It plays a very, a very significant role in King's Quest IV. So I said, we could use 
the end of King's Quest One to set up the mirror's presence on the wall. So as the king dies, I had his last words being, I think the mirror would look good on that wall over there. And then he dies. And Roberta said, well, she laughed and she said, um, I don't think his dying words would be interior decorating tips. And I said, fair enough. I didn't expect it to pass anyway. So um, other than that, she was open to everything. And I, I think I rewrote every word of it because I wanted to, I wanted to keep in mind that eventually I wanted to design. And I thought the way to do that was to write and, and show them that, you know, I could craft, craft the words too, not just make sure it gets out on time and on budget, which is a dreary, horrible job that I wouldn't wish on anyone producing. It sounds like Roberta was pretty open, but uh, what about the fans? Was the do you get uh, heated letters from fans about the changes that you made? I don't believe I ever got a single negative word about the changes to King's Quest One. Uh, I think the fans understood that since we were rebooting the look of it, uh, that we could all. They didn't seem to have a problem with changing the text. Uh, I got a lot of people thanking us for changing the Rumpelstiltskin puzzle, so I felt vindicated by that. Um, and yeah, Roberta w was open to everything. Roberta was always open to everything. She was a very accepting uh, designer, and so was Al Lowe. I mean, they were they would both listen to any suggestions and, and, and give them careful thought. So that's just one of the ways in which Sierra was such a wonderful, creative place to work. Well, I have a question here from fan uh, Tom, I believe this is pronounced Tom Remy Flygel. Okay. An interesting name, but he wants to, Hi, he's, Tom. he's asking about the difficulty of uh, moving from these parser based puzzles uh, to the games that had the, uh, the, well, the point and click games that uh, we're familiar with now. So, right. How would you describe that? Uh, torturous. Um, every designer at Sierra, uh, including myself, uh, had been brought up sort of using the parser interface. And the parser interface allowed us to create any kind of puzzle we could imagine. Um, and it was a it was a wonderful, flexible interface. And now all of a sudden, we were reduced from using an entire dictionary's worth of verbs to four or five. Uh, and it was difficult and painful, I think, for every single designer to try to adjust their thinking uh, and come up with ways to give at least the illusion of the old flexibility. Um, for me, uh, I loved the old Infocom games and uh, text adventures from other companies too. And I, um, I always thought that one of the real joys of adventure games was being rewarded for thinking of things uh, that the designer had already anticipated and provided a specialized response for. Uh, so all of a sudden, I felt like my my arms and legs were cut off and I had no way to reward the player anymore for thinking of clever things because if there's only three or four cursors, um, then sure, you're going to click on everything on the screen. You're not going to think of anything particularly clever to do. You're not going to think of any really clever solutions. So it was a steep learning curve for all of us. Um, I think this was illustrated well in Leisure Suit Larry 5, uh, which was stunningly easy. It was uh, the first Larry game to use a point-and-click interface, and it was extremely easy. Uh, but to be, to be fair, a lot of that was because uh, Ken, had, Ken had looked at our uh, warranty registration cards with the room for comment, and a lot of the comments revealed that nobody was ever finishing the adventure games. So uh, Ken said to Al, I want you to design the next Leisure Suit Larry with a point-and-click interface, and I want you to make it so that 
everyone can finish it with no problem at all. So he made Leisure Suit Larry 5 with point and click, and it was extremely easy, and we got a lot of heat from our longtime fans and a lot of other people applauding us and saying, oh, my God, finally I can finish one of your games. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, it was it was a difficult time for, for everybody, that, that change. Horrible. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll be back next week with a part two of my interview with Josh Mandel. A lot of great content coming up. The best is definitely yet to come, so stay tuned. And as always, I want to thank people who have donated to this show and help support my efforts uh, to preserve game history. I was uh, reminded of uh, Steve Jobs passing away recently. Uh, you know, people don't last forever, and a lot of the designers of our favorite games will eventually pass away. Some of them have already. Uh, so I think it's very important to try to get in touch with them before that happens, to interview them, um, ask them questions, try to learn from them, gain, some, gain something from their insights uh, before it's too late. And by making a, a small donation uh, to Matt Chat, you'll be doing a small part uh, to help preserve uh, the history and legacy of uh, video games. So uh, thank you very much. As always, I'll have some links for you um, on the show notes if you would like to donate to the show. You can either uh, pay a monthly subscription of five bucks or more, or you can just make a one-time uh, payment. Either way, you'll be supporting the show, supporting my efforts, and I thank you for that. And remember, guys, the greatest game in the world is the one waiting for you to design it.